Um, well, uh, welcome everyone. Um, we are here for another conversation uh, uh, and we're very grateful for Simakai Chiguru for coming along tonight. Uh, he's the Associate Professor of African Politics here in Oxford and uh, a fellow of St. Anthony's. And uh, interestingly, Simakai, if you can explain your journey, because you, you're really a medic, aren't you? Or you, you trained as a medic. Um, uh, and you've sort of morphed through your research, which uh, has latterly been in, um, in into epidemics, uh, into a, a much sort of broader um, study of, of the social politics of inequality in Africa. But, but do you want to just tell us a bit about that 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 academic journey and and how you've um, how you've ended up here doing the things that you're doing? Sure, absolutely. Well, I mean, first and foremost, uh, I'd like to just thank you, Alan, for this invitation to join you in conversation and uh, to thank everybody here who's, uh, who's tuned in for this. Um, as you point out, yeah, I've had something of a meandering journey uh, to my current position. I grew up in Zimbabwe and moved to the UK uh, for my studies. I was uh, an international student uh, reading medicine at Newcastle University. Uh, where I was for um, six years in total. And during that time, I always had an eye toward Africa. Um, it had been my ambition to go back to Zimbabwe, um, either to practice medicine or to work in a public health capacity. Um, I had a really quite moving experience uh, or a crystallizing experience, let me put it that way, um, when I was in my fourth year of study and I went to work in South Africa for two months. And I was working in a rural hospital um, uh, called Nzibe, which is um, uh, not actually not that far from where Nelson Mandela was born. Um, so it's a really, really uh, rural, remote part of the country. Uh, and while I was there, um, I was seeing things in the clinic that essentially had legend or mythical status in the textbooks that I had in the UK. Uh, women in full-blown eclampsia, uh, patients suffering from cryptococcal meningitis, but just being left um, in the hospital corridors, um, really severe blunt trauma and so on. And it really got me thinking about um, how uh, clinical practice is fundamentally conditioned by the social, economic, and political circumstances that people find themselves in. And, and this really sort of um, uh, kind of sealed itself in my mind through this compelling quote I read from a South African journalist as I was trying to make sense of the forms of inequality I was seeing. And he wrote of South Africa's HIV AIDS epidemic at the time, um, that we should shelve the abiding fiction that disasters don't discriminate, that they flatten everything in their path with democratic disregard. Plagues zero in on the dispossessed, on those forced to build their lives in the paths of danger. And so for many years that followed, I kept thinking about that. You know, what does it mean um, for a disaster not to discriminate and to map onto circuitries of power and privilege? Um, so once I'd finished my uh, medical school. I worked as a clinician uh, for a couple of years before transitioning uh, initially into public health. And public health was uh, quite an engaging field to be in, but um, in this country it's largely taught in quite a technical way with a lot of emphasis on biostatistics and epidemiology. And I wasn't quite able to shake off the political social questions I was interested in and how they might relate to Africa. So I ended up um, retiring from my job as a public health doctor and moving to Oxford, where I uh, read for a master's in African studies, uh, which is like nothing like I had done before. Um, it's a kind of interdisciplinary program in history, politics and anthropology. So really deep into the social sciences. And I guess my vision at the time was to try to unite in a way uh, my background in medicine and public health with my growing interest and expertise in the social sciences. Um, I loved my MSc and I had a really enjoyable year doing that degree. Um, and so I stayed on for a PhD in international development uh, here in Oxford as well. Um, and my doctorate looked at the, the social and political causes and consequences of Zimbabwe's catastrophic cholera outbreak of 2008. Uh, you know, this resulted in about 100,000 people being infected and over 4,000 deaths, which at the time um, was the worst cholera outbreak in, in African history. 
Um, and so that doctorate has gone on to be the basis of my book that was published earlier this year called The Political Life of an Epidemic, Cholera Crisis and Citizenship in Zimbabwe. Uh, and so it wasn't long after I'd finished my, my DPhil that I ended up getting uh, appointed as an associate professor um, of African politics with this um, ongoing interest um, in the politics of epidemics and disease um, and using those in, as an entry point to study um, society and inequality with a keen interest in Africa. That's a that's a, a fascinating journey. Um, now, uh, I mean, let's begin with 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 Oxford now. And and um, I, I think when you were when you were talking at, or rather speaking at outside Oriel College recently, you 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 were introduced or you introduced yourself as one of maybe six or seven black professors at at, at Oxford. I mean, the, the sketch in sketch in for us the uh, the problem that you think Oxford has in in terms of all the issues that have risen to the surface in the last couple of months. Right. Yeah. I mean, it's it's a tricky question in part because um, there are many different dimensions to this. So. Um, maybe what I'll do is I'll, I'll think about them in kind of three key domains that might help sort of structure our thought. Uh, one of the domains we can talk about is our questions around representation. Um, the other area that we might want to think about are questions around curriculum. Um, and then the third, of course, is about um, the physical space of Oxford, its iconography. Now, in terms of representation, um, you know, every year there is some controversy um, around the low admission of black and minority ethnic students in Oxford um, at the undergraduate level, but particularly of black students. Um, you know, politicians like David Lammy um, are keen to shine a spotlight on this issue and to put pressure on the university for how it uh, recognizes achievement amongst a wider pool of potential applicants um, as well as how it tackles issues of access. Now, some of the challenges around achieving this are internal to the university. They have to do with um, the highly decentralized model um, of the university, you know, with each college being a self-governing unit um, and each program kind of recruiting individually. Um, and that means that there's a lot more room for these processes to be shaped by uh, the kind of contingency of who's on the selection panel. And if you have an institution which is overwhelmingly white, which comes, which is overwhelmingly represented by a certain class background, and in some cases, even by particular geographic regions of the country, uh, the tendency towards uh, reproduction, um, selecting students in that same image uh, kind of increases. So I think that's that's a facet here. I think obviously, you know, one can't lay all of the blame at Oxford's feet. Uh, a big part of it is a, is a larger indictment about the forms of socioeconomic inequality that exist in Britain more generally, such that by the time you get to um, higher education, um, there's a lot of kind of path dependency that has set in place already. And then when we kind of project forward, um, so thinking about the pipeline that takes people from undergraduate study to postgraduate study and then to um, entering the academy, um, many of the sorts of issues already highlighted are sort of amplified in a way. Um, we have more and more selection processes that find it really hard um, to pick out a wider pool of, of candidates. Uh, I think there's a host of reasons for that. I think... <sighs> A big issue as well is that there are all sorts of hierarchies um, that exist um, in, this, in this university that also come to bear in different ways on, say, faculty representation. So if we were to look at, say, the situation I'm in, um, as I, as so I'm, a, I'm one of about seven um, Black you know, professors or associate professors in the university. Um, of the seven, we don't keep official statistics, so this is all really by word of mouth, but the numbers are so small, you tend to know who everybody is. So of the seven of us, you know, four of us are in the same college. We're all at St. Anthony's. And St. Anthony's specializes in international studies um, and in area studies. So we're a college made up purely of humanities and social scientists of people who are interested in the global South. Um, and so that means that, um, 
the those of us who come from um, um, a black background, uh, who are black, sorry, um, you know, we we are two of out of three of us all study Africa, um, and the fourth one, you know, um, built his career initially working on Africa. So. It, it, it also shows that there's a kind of parochialism that might exist within the disciplines. Um, so an underrepresentation, say, in the sciences or in other branches of the humanities. So I think that that's a big issue here, and, and we would need to really push um, that conversation to understand um, kind of what shapes or conditions that. Um, I think amongst the kind of high-flying um, black professors that we see in the global academy, um, the United States is just much further along in attracting that kind of talent and entrenching it, but it creates these huge divides. So when I speak to colleagues, um, you know, in Africa, in the academy, who are not, say, doing African politics per se, but might just be in politics or in another branch of study, uh, they already feel sort of eliminated from being in it, applying for jobs in an institution like this because they don't know the kind of norms and codes. They don't have the familiarity with the customs and the, in, and the insider language that's often needed to get a job in a place like Oxford. So I think that's kind of, it's a, it's a broad sketch and there's a lot in there, but I think that's a big part of it. And certainly, like, like one of the things that could be changed uh, relates to the second point, which is, is about curriculum. Um, well, like pa pa pause there for a second, because yeah. <laughs> this is, um, is a very uh, good way of thinking about these blocks. But just, just on the first, um, because I think a lot, a lot of people around the university um, had been thinking about this for a long time, but, 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 but a, a lot of the, 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 the movement for change is, is slow. Um, yeah. And you'll be familiar with the arguments. So at undergraduate level, the pushback is, well, it's, it's not Oxford's problems to solve the ills of society. We, we can only pick the, the, the people who, who apply. And surely you wouldn't expect us to take people who are, you know, sadly less well-educated because they went to less good schools um, and equally at professor level and academic level, um, are you, you know, what, what are you asking us to do? So uh, you must be tired of, of, of uh, addressing these, but, but what, what, what are your, what, when, when you hear those kind of arguments, what, what do you, what, what positive uh, ways of addressing this problem do you recommend? Yeah, I mean, that, those are good questions. I mean, so I think that, Okay, so I think one issue is that um, there's often a kind of assumption or a conflation. Or, um, actually, let me, let, me, let me rephrase that. There's a fallacy that one of the reasons why the pool of people who ends up here is not as diverse as it should be has something to do with, um, with talent or ability. And so, I mean, I remember being at, at a meeting last year, I think, um, from the Central University that was talking about access strategies. And one of the high level um, administrators from the uh, vice chancellor's office said, you know, we want to put in um, the following measures in place to attract more BME students, but, you know, not at the expense of academic rigor. And I'm like, that's already, that's a, that's a fallacy. That's a miscognition. Uh, we're kind of reproducing this idea that widening access is somehow to compromise on standards. And I don't think that that is an evidence-based claim, nor do I think it does a deep enough job of understanding um, uh, what forms of talent exist amongst young people throughout the country and how it might express itself, right? So Oxford, I think, is a bit different to many other universities, you know, with obviously the exception of Cambridge and some of the other collegiate universities, in the sense that it's not only an educational institute, it's kind of a whole social system and one that reflects particular forms of class identity, racial identity, and privilege, which means that the Oxford interview, for instance, means not only being able to show the quality of what's in your mind, but also means being able to embody and inhabit a space with a certain degree of ease and to, and to grasp a way of performing in order to get in. So I think that having that sort of conversation uh, might complicate some of the ways we think about the interview. Now, I do know that, um, uh, like people who are involved in undergraduate admissions recruiting are looking at a number of social indicators in order to grasp at a wider pool. I guess one of the ways in which we could think more proactively 
uh, about this is not only at the receiving end of the applications, but about more uh, proactive and engaged forms of going out into schools, of talking people through the process and trying to give a bit of a leg up, or at least trying to level the playing field where, you know, at many um, private schools in this country, you have much more bespoke training to get into, to apply to, to, to Oxbridge. That's not universal. And um, just on the claim that it's not Oxford's job to fix society's ills, I think that argument um, holds limited water, not least because um, of the number of people from Oxford who are involved in running this country, um, whether that's in government, in the civil service, in law, in finance, and in the media. There is a powerful way in which um, the Oxford uh, undergraduate degree has gone on to shape um, key centers um, of, of knowledge production and of the economy in this country. So we can't simultaneously have this outsized uh, influence on society at one end and then deny responsibility uh, for playing a more equitable role on the other. Okay, let, let, let's move on to, to curriculum. So I, I mean, I, I, even in the last two months, I've been aware of colleagues who um, are having uh, quite hurried discussions now, and I think Rose must fall must take the credit for this. That that uh, and 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 of course, Black Black Lives Matter generally. But a why is it taking so long? And b why is it so hard? Right. <laughs> I think one of the reasons why, you, so there's a certain way in which the different problems um, all kind of feed into each other and sometimes create um, a negative feedback loop, right? So if you have a university like ours, let's pick a subject, let's say history. You know, most of the history faculties predominantly made up of historians of Britain, many of whom come from a particular lineage of study, um, many of whom teach primarily or exclusively within the colleges. Um, so how do you sort of shift that when you're trying to get all of these different colleges to say that, you know, you've taught for your whole career um, Tudor history, let's say, and you've never really had to think much about Black Britain, let alone um, histories from outside the North Atlantic world. You know, it's really hard to introduce um, widespread curriculum review without at the same time thinking uh, about the models of teaching and the makeup of the faculty. So I think that that's one issue. Um, I think another issue has got to just has got to do with what we come to understand as canonical, you know, so um, an idea about, you know, what are the classics? This is particularly true in disciplines like philosophy, history, literature, uh, and others in the humanities, but also within the, the social sciences. You know, what, what makes up prelims? What do we think are the key things that people need to know? And if that canon um, over-represents, um, uh, over represents, say, white authors, or British authors, or um, authors of a European tradition, um, that means that um, other forms of knowledge are marginalized and then that gets reproduced because they're not seen to be having an important or influential role in shaping, you know, thinking within those subjects. I'll give you one more example. You know, so my, my field um, is African politics. And I always feel kind of ambivalent about that job title uh, because on one hand, um, it is an endlessly intriguing and thoroughly engaging subject, both in terms of understanding current affairs, but also the deeper epistemological questions about how do we come to understand such a, a complicated, interesting continent. Now, undergraduates are not exposed to those kinds of debates at all because African politics is, occupies a kind of marginal space within the PPE curriculum. It's a kind of option course that you can take and is really run by two of my colleagues who are in um, the politics department and you know, their doctoral students. Um, so you would need to have a real shift uh, within how PPE is taught to say that like, well, if we want to have an introduction to politics, there's actually stuff that we can learn about state formation, democracy, representation, liberalism, and so on that comes from Africa or, you know, from Latin America or wherever else. Um, but that's not how we organize our teaching. So I think there are just so many different paradigm shifts that would need to occur in order to, to hasten the speed um, of curriculum transformation. Is it, so again, um, if, if you were um, May Vice-Chancellor tomorrow, 
and and could wave a magic wand how would you because i mean i i completely get what you say and i rec recognize all all the i mean i'm i've been in oxford 5 years and you know that doesn't take long before you see all the problems and all the reasons why things don't change but but how, how can you make things change yeah given all the problems that you know about because you've you, you've been here long enough to understand all the the, the obstacles to change yeah, I mean, it's, it's a hard one. I mean, I will caveat my answer here by saying that I only teach graduate students. Uh, and I find in the, in the graduate realm, it's a lot easier um, to, to bring about change. You get, um, certainly in the areas that I work, I have a lot of independence in terms of, say, designing my own option courses. Um, I think, you know, if I could make, wave a magic wand, I think one of the things that I um, would try to push for would be the sort of in-depth kind of reflective exercises that some faculties have tried to do where you have really substantial um, kind of away days. As a, away days is sort of the wrong term, but teach-ins, I guess, in which you have both curriculum review and where you gauge student opinion on the sorts of things that they're interested in. But you also try to, in the first instance, take advantage of some of the um, knowledge that already exists within the university. So, for instance, a number of my colleagues um, who are uh, ostensibly regional specialists have a great deal um, that they could contribute to more general discussions about social theory. Um, why aren't those people being invited in to um, PPE design uh, meetings or history and politics uh, undergraduate meetings to think about different literatures or curriculum? So, uh, in a sense, you'd have to shift past some of the decentralized ways of thinking within the university and have much more cross-fertilization um, of topics. I think that there are a number of universities that have done this thing quite well. Um, and we would, um, we could potentially start to learn from them. I think um, in parts of the US, this form of reckoning has happened um, because of the, the debates that have been there around African-American representation, which have kind of pushed some of these issues um, further. So I think, you know, trying to, to learn from institutions that have done this elsewhere. But my sense is that um, Oxford is quite a self-referential place, um, which means that the looking elsewhere and the thinking more widely doesn't happen as much as it, as it should. Um, and then I think there's also ways about how we think about the distribution of money within the institution. So creating diversity funds that are not kind of competitively fought over to uh, in a sort of detrimental way, but really trying to reward departments and colleges for being innovative um, in their hiring practices, but also in their in their pedagogy. Um, these are just some ideas off the top of my head, but I I, I don't I haven't really seen that kind of thing happening as much as as I, you know it could do. Okay. Um, I should have said at the beginning, that please, please start asking questions because I'm going to, I'm going to, um, um, we're, we're, I'm going to talk with, with um, Simukai for a bit, but I, but I hope um, there'll be lots of questions and I can see some, some appearing already, but um, I, I, actually there's one from, from Gassio, who's our professor of music. I don't, don't know, Gassio, do you, do you want to come in and ask that yourself or do you want me to, to uh, read it out for you? It's, it's a very good question. Alan, if you don't mind reading it out, that would be great. Okay, Thanks. all right. So um, this, this is Gassi says, I recently read that if there is only one person of color in the shortlist for a job, the chances for getting that job are statistically zero. Similar for women. If there's only one, her chance is zero. That's because they are seen more in relation to their different starter candidates than for their merits. Even if we can't change UK employment yours, brackets yet could we implement a best practice policy at Oxford that requires every shortlist for every job to have a minimum of two candidates of color and how would we do that in practice um, so I don't have an answer for the policy side of the question I mean it's a really important one um, I'd actually my colleague uh, Catherine Costello who's a, a lawyer specializing in refugee law has spent a lot of time thinking about different forms of discrimination law. And she's been mounting a number of challenges, both within the department um, and, in, and at St. Anthony's, um, about, the, about uh, more rigorous measures that we could take when it comes to thinking about shortlisting. But I, I'd highlight something within the question, which is about 
um, the kind of underlying attitudinal dimension here, which is that um, minority ethnic candidates and women are often seen um, in terms of their difference. Um, and this echoes um, a widely shared sentiment um, that if you are, say, a person of color in a predominantly white space, you have to, you know, do twice as well to get half as far. Um, and uh, the sociologist Nirmal Puar um, at Goldsmiths has studied this dynamic, um, sort of su subjective experiences of um, people who identify as BME and, and of women um, in the civil service and in academia, and has found consistently that there is this problem of invisibility. Um, and I think one of the things that that suggests to me is that it's both changing our policies and our practices, but also changing our cultures, which I think then shape our image of who is, you know, appropriately, like, what is the image of an Oxford professor, let's say, um, who, how do we come to, you know, consciously or subconsciously um, link uh, ideas of competence or excellence to certain types of people and not others. I think that that's a big part of this conversation. And I'm often keen uh, to say to colleagues that when we're talking about questions of diversity or um, uh, race and difference, that we can't only talk about, say, gender in relation to women or race in, in relation to BME people. We also need to talk about gender in relation to men and uh, race issues in relation to whiteness. And I think that that it's part of a bigger issue. I think that there's a real problem in being able to talk about, um, you know, as a sort of social structure, how whiteness um, shapes the culture of this, uh, of this university and many other elite institutions in the UK. So I'd also push the, the, the cultural conversation in that direction. Okay, so let's move on to um, uh, iconography. Um, so, <laughs> um, yeah. Well, let's let, let's begin with with um, the recent decision by Oriel after um, a very sustained campaign of, of five years. Oriel seems to have changed its mind and said roads ought to fall. And having said roads ought not to fall, I mean you've got your own particular history with Cecil Rose that you wrote about recently in the Guardian. So, do you want to just? explain what your view of Rhodes was compared with the way that mm. you found he was regarded when, when the, this debate first kicked off in 2015? Yeah, I mean, so I was, I think I was 12 years old when I first heard that there was such a thing called the Rhodes Scholarship. Um, and I remember being really shocked. I had just started high school um, at a very, you know, um, elite private school in Harare and we'd been ushered into um, our welcome hall and they had these plaques of, uh, my school is called St. George's, um, and there were these plaques on the wall of old Georgians who had gone on to win the Rhodes Scholarship. Now, having grown up in Zimbabwe, uh, part of the Born Free Generation, and knowing that my father had grown up in Rhodesia and had ended up joining the nationalist struggle, had fought in the war, had been um, exiled um, from Zimbabwe to go to Uganda where he met my mom, had come back to fight in the war, had been in prison, all at the hands of Rhodesia. It was really kind of firmly imprinted in my life kind of growing up um, that the form of colonial government that existed in our country was really one predicated on racial domination and a certain kind of authoritarianism that obtained across social, economic, and political spheres. Uh, disenfranchisement, um, economic, um, like uh, an economic cleavage in which um, white settler colonialists um, owned up to 80% of arable land, the lion's share of business, commerce, and trade, um, lived in uh, what were effectively countrified suburbia, while the black majority lived in so-called tribal trust lands. So there is this really um, deep and painful um, history of structural and systemic uh, racism and colonialism. And it's continued to haunt Zimbabwe in various ways, uh, including um, the forms of iconography that exist in Harare that have slowly been changed over time. And so Rhodes for me was both a kind of uh, symbol, 
of that history for a very long time, but also he was more than a sim symbol. He was a historical actor that helped set and train um, this pattern of colonialism that I'm describing and a phenomenal degree of expropriation, um, exploitation of labor and expropriation of wealth from Southern Africa. And so the Rhodes statue here in Oxford is one that's treated um, uh, not only in a way that, you know, reframes Rhodes' legacy as munificence, but physically where that statue is situated, sitting above um, kings and saints, uh, is a way in which um, Rhodes sought to immortalize himself. Um, my friend and, and colleague, uh, Natalia uh, Din Kariuki, who's now teaching at Warwick, um, wrote, uh, she was a Rhodes scholar herself, and she wrote a very lovely piece in the um, London Review of Books um, about Rhodes's determination to immortalize himself, even against a lot of the opposition that existed to that at the time from within this university, let alone the numerous forms of war and insurgency that had been fought against Rhodes's imperialism within Southern Africa. Um, and so all of that to say that um, my personal history is entangled uh, in the Rhodes Must Fall movement. So when he fell in South Africa, um, the, I was part of a number of students who felt a similar sort of energy to raise these uncomfortable questions here in Oxford. You know, and Rhodes is certainly not the only figure, but he was the one that garnered attention in this historical moment. And it just struck me as very, very bizarre that the arguments for keeping the statue in place really knew nothing about Rhodes's history um, and really downplayed um, the brutality of his colonialism and expropriation and totally erased and hid from view um, the stories of African labor and life that had been you know, um, lost uh, under uh, the aegis of Cecil John Rhodes. And, and I guess the point, the point about Rhodes is not that we're rewriting history by wanting to take his statue down because it, people knew about it at the time, that, 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 that it wasn't a, it's not a, a modernist reading of a, a different era. Uh, Right. And I think there's, there's two things there, because um, you're absolutely right. This is not a kind of contemporary, you know, reading of that particular history. But, but this is still, that framing, that aspect of the debate is still quite Eurocentric. Right. So we'd still be saying, well, who are these people that we're talking about? I mean, people fought actual wars against Rhodes. Um, so to say that he was opposed in his time, I mean, that's manifestly true in Southern Africa. So even if this was a normal artifact of the British Empire, we would still have legitimate cause to ask that, you know, Oxford University is not simply a reflection of empire. It's also a reflection of being uh, ostensibly a cosmopolitan institute of learning, and it owes a specific debt um, to the parts of the world um, um, where its estate had been built either through colonialism or slavery. You know, so I think in both senses, whether it's internal to Britain or whether it's part of this wider global history, um, we would be right to question um, the place of Rhodes. Now, I, th I think you, in, in the arguments that people make uh, against Rhodes, you are less sympathetic to the argument that says, I, I feel personally threatened by, by him being there, or I feel offended, or... So it's not so much the, the personal as the political that, that is, is the argument that, that cuts most ice with you. Yeah, so it's, that's a good question. Um, I'm gonna speak here very much for myself and not for other people involved in Rhodes Must Fall because there are a host of different motivations and different ways in which people might feel alienated in a place like Oxford. And I think we, you know, part of the daily experience of being a student of color in a place like this is one of ambiguous inclusion and exclusion, a sense of never quite or never fully belonging, um, a sense that it can be quite difficult to claim the institution on your own. And I think that that can have quite adverse psychic consequences. And for some people, um, the road statue and the pride of place it holds can be one that feels like quite an affront and an affront that might be experienced in a sort of psychic sense, if you like. Uh, for me personally, it's less about um, feeling, you know, personally injured or feeling an assault on my, on say, my mental health. I've, I've lived in 
um, and have been learning how to survive amongst white people for a long time. Um, so I've kind of adapted. Um, and it's more a sense of um, thinking about the values that my institution holds and to what extent those values um, can be more critically self-reflexive and encouraged to accommodate um, uh, uh, not only the kind of wider, like a more diverse demographic, but be, can be kind of representative of the fact that I can be here and have a voice. I can have a say about how we mark public space. Um, that Oxford is not only one for the elite, it's also something that can be quite a progressive force in the world. Um, and I think that what many of the people who dismiss Rhodes' most four students as victims uh, are kind of missing out is that they're reinforcing a very narrow view about who properly belongs uh, in Oxford. And they're treating those who want to articulate a different history for Oxford, a different sense of presence in this institution. They're sort of treating them as petulant or infantile. And I think that that's a real source of, of hurt and injury. And, you know, politically for me is, 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 is egregious, to be honest. So the, the demands that are that are currently being made in the in the in the wake of Black Lives Matter uh, and the and the rekindling of this issue, then move on to Codrington at, at All Souls. I, I had a conversation on on Monday with um, Sir Hilary Beckles of, of the University of West Indies, who's a great scholar of slavery, um, uh, and his view was that Codrington was so incongruous in a library or a place of learning that uh, he, he, he couldn't countenance the, the, the statue being there um, in, in, inside the library. I mean, do you have a view more generally about where all these, I mean, would, would you remove Codrington personally and, 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 and what kind of home would you, would you find and what kind of context in order to have what kind of discussion um, you know, I think that there's, at times, I think that we, 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 we sometimes suffer from a critical lack of imagination when we think about iconography in public space. You know, I think that there's a lot more that could be done in terms not only of, say, renaming things, um, resituating statues, but also upholding different um, uh, figures or events that we wish to commemorate and to celebrate. Um, that we can move past the big men view of history and think about um, how Oxford has been a site at various uh, points in time for different forms of history, for different sorts of ideas, ways that uh, if um, uh, kind of articulate or refract a more kind of cosmopolitan interesting and interesting view of the world. Um, so in this sense, you know, something like the Codrington Library, um, I think would be perfectly uh, a good opportunity to say, well, can we repurpose this library and say that given Codrington's role in slavery, this could become a particular site of learning for the history of slavery and of upholding um, the, the, the lives and celebrating the ordinary people of the West Indies who lost so much through Codrington's estate. And can we think about forms of, say, fellowship and scholarship and books that honor that? And, you know, we can have this conversation across the institution. Um, I think that there's a lot more creative and imaginative thinking to be done around, around these sorts of questions. Um, and one that is uh, sort of beyond the um, dichotomy that I sometimes hear, that we either keep something up or we take it away. You know, I think that we have more options available to us than that. And um, where are you on reparations? Because, again, talking to Sir Hilary, who's, who's very... Uh, l l learned and thoughtful and has been um, pr pressing for reparations now for, for um, maybe two decades. Um, he, he's st studied closely the amount that was paid in reparations at the time of the, the, the Emancipation Act. Uh, and I've seen uh, articles now that are, that are pricing this in, in hundreds of billions, if not trillions, if you were actually going to um, be serious about, um, uh, about this. But, but, but is that a, a field that interests you or are there, are there other ways of addressing the, the, the issue that interests you more? Right, so I think, 
I won't say too much about this because I'm not an expert on um, reparations. And I think that there's actually some very good scholarship um, and activist work that's been done on reparations. Um, and once you enter that arena of discussion, um, you have the kind of economic side of the argument that you're, you're putting forward. Um, and then there are other forms. There are people who talk about reparations in the form of different forms of uh, recognition. Um, and again, ways of giving to communities, work, ways of adjusting or changing different kinds of institutional practices. I, I think that there's an awful lot of learning to be done by all of us about what reparations does. Uh, what, I'm, what I'm wary of is a certain style of defeatist thinking that says, well, you know, the cost of reparations is so incalculable and it's so large that it's not even worth embarking on. You know, so we, we end up with, with the perfect being an enemy of the good. Um, and I think what that misses out on are the, the host of other things that um, thinkers of reparations are kind of putting forward as ways of, of, of working through the stuff, you know, not in an instant, but over time. Let's talk about the, the last couple of months since the, the killing of George Floyd and, and the, the, the enormous er, eruption around the world of, of anger and um, energy for, 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 to take this, this moment seriously. Um, I mean, what gives you hope that this is not just a moment and that this is going to, this is going to last and, and this momentum can be built on, if you have that hope. <laughs> I do have that hope, um, but it's a cautious hope. It's, it's um, you know, again, as a, as a scholar of politics with a bit of a historical bent, I'm aware that progress, um, to the extent that I believe in progress, is not a linear thing. Um, it's hard won and it's fought over and it's contingent. Um, I would say that this time round, for one, the, the how widespread um, anti-racist protest has been in different parts of the world um, does feel um, qualitatively different, or at the very least quantitatively different, uh, in the sense there's just a lot more of it happening. But I do think it's also qualitatively different in the sense that, you know, Black Lives Matter, for example, um, exists as a specific form of political organization within the United States that's trying to achieve certain concrete programmatic aims, but it also exists as an idea. It's become a vehicle through which many, um, many Black people, myself included, haven't really known how to articulate the forms of racism um, that we experience in daily life. Um, this is not necessarily uh, racism at the hands of the police. Thankfully, I've never, I mean, I've been stopped and searched once and that's it. Um, but I have been subject to all manner of other forms of much more subtle racism. And I think Black Lives Matter has been quite uh, an effective means of provoking this kind of conversation, of legitimating experiences, of allowing people to be bolder and to, uh, and to, to have something of a voice. And I think that's gained greater traction, um, say in the UK, than it has, um, at least in the 15 or 17 years that I've been living here. Um, 17 years now, yeah. Um, i give you one example. I, I heard a discussion just this morning on uh, Radio 4 after the Today program on race and public space in Britain. And to be honest, I'd never heard anything like that on Radio 4 with a diverse array of thinkers talking about all manner of um, statues and symbols and different ways in which they might be used to, um, to advance the race debate. And the same is true of the volumes that's being written and so on. So I think that this moment potentially serves to bring uh, many more experiences to the fore um, that can be used for richer public conversation. So that's my hope that that, that happens. Um, but as I say, it is contingent and there is a backlash against this in the form of the culture war as well as um, the far right. So how long it lasts, I don't know. Um, I'm going to try and bring in Vishnu Priya, um, unless again, Vishnu, you want me to read the question, but, but if you're there, can you, can you come in and ask the question that you, you've asked in the, in the chat? So the question is, we often learn or experience quotes race hyphen color as the other, as opposed to difference. How do you navigate this and the prevalent tokenism 
while teaching a not so inclusive in curriculum to a demographic who, like you rightly mentioned, come from a particular worldview and social class? Uh, that's a tough question. Um, I guess on one hand, um, because I personally only teach graduate students, I teach in uh, a department where these conversations are much more normalized. Um, we're constantly reinventing our curriculum. Um, so I don't, I don't, I'm thankfully not personally encumbered um, with teaching a curriculum that I find, you know, problematic or troubling. But I totally agree that we, we're often to see race as, as, as other. We're also taught not to see whiteness and white people in particular are taught not to see race, uh, let alone to understand themselves as racialized. And then that obscures the view that, you know, race is um, a secular historical concept. It comes into existence at a particular moment of history and serves certain kinds of power interests um, while diminishing others. Um, and so to the extent that I can, and it's really limiting, to the extent that I can, I often think um, about using some of the categories that feel less familiar to my students, um, a way of rendering the strange familiar and the familiar strange to try to push some of these discussions. And I do the same in my administrative meetings in the department and the college. Um, but I'm still working through many of these questions myself, and I suspect um, we'll be embarking on some deeper writing uh, about these sorts of issues. Um, a, a question from Tom Hughes, which I'll read out because it's so short, um, which, which is really um, how you think COVID has affected the Black Lives Matter movement and, and whether it's in some ways slowed the progress that otherwise might have happened. So I, I, at this moment in time, I don't think we know because we could also um, pose the, uh, if you like, kind of the question in converse, you know, was there so much traction for Black Lives Matter this time around because of COVID-19? Because there's so many more people who are at home, who have not been going to work, who are being exposed to and bombarded by the media, who are seeing the intersections between police violence economic inequality and the differences uh, in mortality rates because of the pandemic you know so there's a certain sense in which COVID-19 and the killing of George Floyd created a perfect storm um, for Black Lives Matter um, to, to spread in the way that it did um, I think we're too close to the events of the moment to fully figure it out um, so this is definitely a kind of moment that will be revisited for quite a long time still. Okay, we've, we've got two questions from history undergraduates and, and I'm hoping if they've, if they've got good uh, connections, they might ask them themselves. Uh, Olivia, do you want to come in and, and ask yours? Hi, um, first of all, thank you so much. Um, yeah, as Alan said, I'm a history undergraduate and I'm really interested in going into um, curriculum reform, museum reform, public history reform, all of these kind of issues. I just wanted to ask in, uh, so my question just reads, I'm wondering what your opinions are in regard to post-colonialism and neo-colonialism in both institutions such as Oxford and in your studies of African history politics. There's obviously a clear need for decolonizing British institutions and for this to be done we have to recognize and pay attention to the oppressive uh, influence Britain has had and still continues to have in areas in the global south. However, I recognize throughout my time studying history that there's a danger that if you boil issues within African history and politics to both the years of British imperialism and the years that followed, that narrative is just as colonial because you're seeing Britain as kind of a model that was either followed or was not followed. Um, so in your studies, Mm -hmm. Where do you kind of see the place for imperialism? Do you think it's not talked about enough or do you think it's exaggerated? Mm -hmm. um, that's a wonderful question. Thank you, Olivia. Um, so when I'm wearing my scholar hat and not my, um, and not my activist hat, um, conversations about um, imperialism are intensely complicated, uh, not least because Imperialism as a historical phenomenon is as multifaceted, uh, diverse, difficult to pin down uh, as any other. It has um, 
an array of different iterations. So I think that in terms of curriculum reform, we need to be having those conversations. We need to be, um, in a sense, getting messy, but also expanding our view for who it is that's talking about imperialism, so that we're not kind of reifying uh, a kind of uh, static singular model or that we can either agree with or you know, uh, reject in its totality, but we're um, giving ourselves better exposure uh, to the messiness and contingency of history. I think that the problem, part of the problem is that in um, the short thrift public debates on these sorts of questions, um, many people call for complexity disingenuously as a way to dismiss activists like Rhodes must fall students as a way of, uh, so complexity is then used sort of disingenuously. Um, so I'd like to see um, us kind of accepting the fact that we need uh, more uh, expansive and complicated ways of understanding the past, which would then put categories like imperialism under greater scrutiny. Issy, do you want to come in and, and ask your question? Hi, I think you might have partly already answered it, but yeah, but thank you so much um, for everything you've said so far. I'm just, I am interested in kind of in what types of curriculum reforms you would specifically propose. Mm -hmm. um, I'm really starting to understand some of the limitations of my degree as an undergraduate historian because like there's two mandatory papers on British history, but the entire history of the world can apparently be taught in one subject. And um, I'm about to study um, next term tutors for the fourth time in my educational career. <laughs> and I'm kind of a bit, a bit finished um, with the tutors. I think I've reached the limit of how much I can know about them. Yeah, I mean, you know, to, to me, this all seemed quite obvious in, 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 in the sense, you know, you, you, you've kind of asked and answered your question, you know, there's, there's uh, this kind of uh, repetition, um, not only of um, British history, but of a certain kind of British history, um, just as a profound disservice to you know your education as a student to us as faculty but also to the wider citizenry um because it it creates this you know sort of stolid like limited view um on what history as a discipline can be um and like without knowing the kind of intricacies of how the actual history undergraduate degree is is structured uh it seems to me uh, entirely parochial even mind-boggling um that history outside of europe is 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 treated in such a cursory or ancillary manner i mean come on like you know how could we possibly understand either the past or the modern world um with with such blinkers Sorry, we seem to have lost Alan just for a second. <laughs> uh, cool. I'm going to quickly have a look if there is uh, another question. We've got another question from Gaskia uh, that says, um, what you said about the perfect being the enemy of the good, i.e. reparations, is very interesting. It seems there are interesting parallels with defunding the police and abolishing the system of mass incarceration in the US, for example people would have said that the idea of defunding the police was unthinkable, unfeasible even just a short while ago. And yet now it seems like many cities are actually redistributing funds, defunding the police, etc. I just, did you have any comments on that at all? I think Alan might have rejoined us now as well. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I would briefly quote Mandela who says it always seems impossible until it's done. Um, and I think that this moment, particularly the question around defunding the, the police, has shown us that the scope for what we might uh, imagine as being socially possible or feasible is often much greater than we tend to think it is when we become conditioned to seeing the world in a particular way. I'm sorry about that. I suddenly, my, my, something crashed here. I, but, um, Jamila, come, come in. When people speak of reparations, those who are the direct and or indirect beneficiaries of colonialism and the transatlantic slave trade often state that any redistribution of wealth would effectively penalise them. They say that it would be unjust to them as they were not involved. Do you agree with this view? And if not, how would you challenge it? <laughs> um, I don't agree with this view. Um, <sighs> there are many different ways of challenging it, but I guess one way of looking at it is to um, one is to just recognize the fact that the kind of redistribution of um, wealth, let's say, but redistribution even more expansively is something that societies do all of the time. 
Um, so there's, so it's not that kind of alien of practice as sometimes these questions seem to, to frame it. Um, I would also point out that to think that this is something that's historically done and dusted and people who are beneficiaries of uh, systems based on expropriation have no kind of moral responsibility or duty to think about reparations. I think that's also wrong and misguided and is open to, you know, quite profound uh, philosophical challenge. Um, I think that uh, there are also kind of wider dynamics at play here. So if we were to look, for instance, just at the relationship between, say, foreign aid on one hand to Africa and capital flight out of it, we would find that Africa is actually a net creditor um, by several orders of magnitude to the Western world. Um, and so, and that's partly itself um, a historical relic of the institutional path dependencies um, that create the global financial and economic system. Um, and in that sense, then, that the case for reparations becomes even more urgent because it means kind of rethinking how we structure our global economic systems um, because uh, they continue to benefit kind of iteratively and ongoing um, certain parts of the world and certain subsectors of uh, societies within those parts of the world. Justin, do you want to read if it is from, your, from, from Kerry? Do you want to read Kerry's question or do you want me to read it out? Oh, I'm here, so I can read it. <laughs> oh, Kerry, you, you, you read it out, sorry. Um, I was just, my question is, uh, in response to what's happening right now, um, departments within the university have sort of formed committees, you know, with push from staff and push from students to kind of address race and diversity. And I just was, I was wondering, is there any advice you would give to how these groups should be composed in order to sort of capture the interests of the any people? Um, and I do know of one case where the chairmanship is majority white. Um, so just, you know, what do you think of this? Um, it's a hard one because, um, you know, one wants to avoid the problem of death by committee and then also one wants to avoid the problem of, of you know, what you're describing, that um, you can end up with a committee that doesn't necessarily have a stake in the issues or fully understand them um, in such a way that the problems are either not dealt with or are dealt, dealt with superficially or cosmetically. There's an element of case by case basis here, but what I would say, and, and I'm, I'm saying this not least because, um, you know, as one of the few, you know, black um, faculty members in the university, um, you're, you're quite wary of your labor um, uh, being kind of appropriated with um, not either seeing change or without compensation. I think that, um, a real commitment to making these committees work would incorporate BME people, but would also compensate them um, uh, as appropriate for doing this kind of work, as opposed to simply treating it as um, the inevitable burden of representation that it can can turn out to be. So okay, we're, we're nearing the end, but but tell us tell us about um, what you're working on now. What, what what's your um, what, what's your next book going to be? <laughs> That's a good question. Um, I'm sort of thinking about two big issues. Um, one which is probably um, kind of maybe a longer term thing is that um, having studied um, the politics of Zimbabwe's cholera epidemic, I've, I've been tracking um, the kind of collapse of healthcare in the country since then, or at least it's changing configurations. And that's made me think a lot more about um, how a kind of medical diaspora has been formed from Zimbabwe. So a lot of doctors going to work um, to work uh, in different parts of the world and a lot of patients seeking treatment in different parts of the world. And when you combine this perspective with what's happening with the pandemic, uh, we start to understand the kind of interplay between uh, migration, um, healthcare, and the um, supply chains and how these are all structured in different ways by a radically unequal economic system. So I've been thinking about that uh, and thinking about uh, what that means for, for these deeper questions about equity. Um, the other thing that I've been thinking about is something a bit more personal. Um, so I've started to um, delve a little bit deeper into my own personal archive um, to think through questions of um, inheritance and lost 
after empire. So thinking through my own life and my family history about how we have been shaped and formed um, by wars of liberation, but also let down by the post-colonial promises of Zimbabwe. And at the same time, having lived half my life in the UK, having confronted both the kind of uh, inheritance of imperialism through different sorts of institutions, as well as the loss or amnesia um, about what that means and how that structures life here. So I might write uh, a deeper, more exploratory tome thinking about how identity and belonging are structured by inheritance and loss after empire. Um, so those are kind of the two big things I'm thinking about. They, they both sound mouthwateringly interesting. Um, thank you so much for, for giving up an hour to come and talk to us tonight. It's been fascinating and enriching and provocative and stimulating and all the things we wanted it to be. So thank you. And when we're all allowed to meet again, you must, you must um, stroll over to LMH and, and break bread with us. I'll absolutely do so. And thank you so much for having me. And thank you to everyone in the audience for such wonderful and engaging questions. Thank you. And thank you everybody for coming along. Stay safe.